Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jail, Senior Director of Arts and Culture. The saga of King Sukjong, Queen Inhyun, and concubine Chang Hee Bin is one of the most famous episodes in the 500 years history of Joseon Dynasty, filled with palace intrigues and passionate love affairs. The story of the 19th king of Joseon, his virtuous queen, and one of the most infamous women in the history of Yi Dynasty dominates popular imagination and culture even today. But what was the real story behind this legendary affair? We are thrilled to welcome back Professor Min Soo Kang to the Korea Society to hear his take on the importance of this particular story, the historical myth that has built around the characters and its place in modern Korean society, especially in popular culture. Min Soo Kang is an associate professor at, of European history at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, in addition to articles published in numerous art journals, he's the author of Sublime Dreams of Living Machines and Invincible and Righteous Outlaw, the Korean hero Hong Gil Dong in literature, history, and culture. Professor Kang's talk on that subject is also available on our YouTube channel and website. Professor Kang translated the story of Hong Gil Dong to, for Penguin Classics and his translation of Record of the Virtue of Queen Inhyun, Lady Min, appeared in Azealia, Journal of Korean Literature and, Cult Literature and Culture. Welcome back to the Korea Society, Professor Kang. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was fun the last time. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your question via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email artsandculture at koreasociety.org. And Professor Khan, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, doing this last time around. I'm very happy to do this this time around. So um, I am invited to give this talk because I translated what is a classic Korean novel, a historical drama that was um, uh, written and disseminated in Joseon Dynasty Korea uh, at, at the earliest in the late 18th century and possibly um, in the 19th century, a work that is called The Record of the Virtue of Queen Inhyun, Lady Min, which is one of uh, a number of texts which basically tells the same story and has, uh, has a passage in common that are collectively known as the story of Queen Inhyun. Um, and beyond just uh, a work of classic literature, the story itself has a massive resonance in the culture even today, as I will explain. So uh, to give you a roadmap of what I'll cover uh, tonight, um, I, I, I wanna go into four specific topics. One um, is a very quick synopsis of the story itself. Uh, keeping in mind that this is a story of the novel, not the actual historical events. This is this is the story that you get, and it is it is fiction. It is fiction based on historical uh, story. Um, and there's you know, and, and and if you read it, it'll it'll be very apparent because there's lots of stories of sorcery and you know uh, even ghosts and goblins and so on, right? Um, and uh, so that's a, uh, that's the first part. I'll give you a very uh, brief synopsis. And second, I'll talk a little bit about its um, its significance, especially from the perspective of gender, as reflective of gender uh, ideas that existed in Joseon Dynasty. Um, in the third part, I will um, talk about, I will put uh, on my historian's hat and say, well, what really happened? And how close to reality, um, you know, go goblins and sorcery notwithstanding, to what actually occurred in the Korean royal court um, in the crucial, crucial decades from 1680s to uh, 1701 in those 20, uh, 20 years. And finally, in the fourth part, I will talk a little bit about modern adaptations of this story in Korean uh, movies and, um, and uh, television shows and how uh, it changed over time. And, uh, and so what is the significance now? So when modern day Koreans are watching this show on as K-drama that uh, um, some of which I believe is available on Netflix now because all of a sudden K-drama is really popular in America. <laughs> um, 
And um, and what wh what are they seeing? I mean, what is the message being disseminated um, through the story in modern adaptation, right? Um, all right, so to go on to the first part, so what is the story about? Um, well, the story begins in what is by Western uh, dating, the year 1681, uh, when uh, the king of Joseon Dynasty Korea at the time, King Sukjong, uh, marries uh, a new woman after the death of his first wife, um, who is going to be, after her death, is going to be granted the posthumous name of Queen Inhyun. Inhyun, uh, which means uh, uh, virtue manifested, so manifestation of virtue. So just from that name, you already know where we're going with this. Right? <laughs> um, so so that, that is commonly what we call her, but you have to remember this is a posthumous name. Um, and by the way, the same thing with all the names of Korean kings, King, uh, King Sukjong, that's a posthumous uh, uh, temple name. Um, now this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, woman who, be who becomes Queen Inhyeon, she is from a uh, um, aristocratic Yangban family of Joseon Dynasty Korea. Not only that, from one of the most illustrious um, Yangban families of, of, of the Min family, the Min clan. Um, and in the novel, she is depicted, depicted as a paragon of virtue, right? Uh, of somebody of flawless uh, ethics and behavior, um, kind, uh, obedient, um, you know, suffers through calamities without complaint. Uh, I mean, just a pristine, pristine person. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, oh, oh, you know, uh, despite her, you know, the perfection of her virtue, she's unable to fulfill what could be the most essential function as a queen, no male heir, right? She's, she's unable to produce children. Um, and knowing that this is, how, you know, how this is, how important this is in a kingdom, she's the one who actually in the story urges and urges and urges the king to take on a concubine. So that she, uh, as someone who could provide a uh, born, right? Um, and after some re reluctance, um, King um, Sukjong chooses a woman by the name of Chang Okjong, uh, from the uh, family name Chang, her personal name Okjong. She's not from a fancy Yangban aristocratic family. Um, her father is, uh, is an official in the government, but one of those low level bureaucratic uh, interpreter position. Uh, so she, she doesn't have a, uh, you know, fancy pedigree, um, and she is uh, she she does become the official royal concubine, uh, which which is Bin, and she is eventually granted the name of Hui, Hui meaning fortune. So uh, so Koreans will know her as Chang Hui Bin, which is Chang her, her last name, Hui the granted name of fortune. And pin is the word for a royal concubine, right? So, and, and, and for the purpose of this talk, I'll just call her uh, concubine Chang. Right? Um, now she is able to eventually produce a, a, a son who does become a, um, a, a short-lived uh, successor to King, uh, King uh, um, Sukjong named King Kyungjong. Um, and, uh, um, but the thing is, I mean, she in direct, again, this is in the novel, not real reality, she is portrayed as the exact and direct opposite of Queen Inhyun. Whereas Queen Inhyun is the paragon of virtue, completely flawless. Um, Chang Okjong ok or concubine Chang is regarded as the, the most wicked woman that you could possibly imagine. And uh, what does that mean? Well, she is ambitious, she's conniving, and uh, uh, and she doesn't know her place, and she's not uh, content to become to be the king's concubine and possibly the mother of the future king. She wants to be queen herself, right? So um, so what she what she does is that she launches um, a campaign of rumor mongering against the queen, and uh, spreads all the slanders about the uh, uh, unethical and lascivious behavior of the queen and spreads it across the court, right? Um, and at first, the King Suk, uh, King Sukjong is reluctant to believe it, but he eventually does. And this results in Queen Inhyun being deprived of her position as queen, being ousted from the capital, and even being exiled. And in her exile, um, the, uh, you know, in exile, uh, she suffers greatly because she has to live in uh, this decrepit old house, which is haunted. There's a great little story about how these ghosts and goblins are there, but these virtuous dogs come 
and they balk until the ghosts go away. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, so but she suffers terribly, and in the meantime, concubine Chang, through her connivance, um, and and also through the connivance of corrupt and unethical um, officials, is able to ra raise herself to the status of queen. Right, uh, but then uh, some time passes. <laughs> And uh, uh, you know, after five years of Queen Inhyun suffering in exile, um, the king starts to become suspicious of uh, of her, his new queen and begins to doubt all the slanders. And upon his personal investigation, realizes that Queen Inhyun was has you know was innocent of those rumors and slanders and charges all along. And in his rage, um, he demotes uh, his new queen back to the status of concubine and brings back the queen, uh, brings back the queen. And so Queen Inhyun, after five years of terrible suffering is vindicated and she becomes queen again. Um, now, uh, at this point, Chang Yibin, uh, the concubine Chang is not gonna be content at this situation. So she does the ultimate you know, unthinkable thing, which is that she hires a bunch of shamans and sorcerers to put a curse on the queen. And uh, and every day the queen becomes sicker and sicker until, and the doctors don't know what, you know, why she's sick. And eventually she, you know, um, uh, she falls ill and dies. And this is in the year 1701. Um, and as soon as she dies, um, the King Suk Jong is uh, become suspicious of the circumstances of, of, um, around her death, and he investigates again and finds out indeed that his uh, that concubine Chang has um, has resorted to sorcery and shamans in order to put a curse on her, and orders her execution. In fact, she is ordered to drink a cup of poison, and that's a very dramatic scene in the drama, right? So, and uh, um, and. And the conclusion is that um, Queen Inhyun is praised. Uh, she will go down in history as somebody who suffered without complaint and re always remained virtuous um, and loyal to the king. And uh, uh, and and the evil concubine Chang is dead. Right. Um, all right. So um, so what does this story mean? I, you know, I mean, from, from a scholarly perspective, what what is this story trying to say to Joseon Dynasty readers? Uh, and what did it mean? Right. Um, and it had to do with um, uh, the way, I, I mean, I think the best way to uh, uh, explain this is that in every patriarchal society, uh, a society uh, that is under strict control by men um, and the society that's based on the, uh, on the uh, subordinate position of women and keeping them there, there's, the, uh, there's this ideology that is used. And this is not just in Korea, but in, in pretty much in every patriarchal culture you can find this where, Women are told that there are two categories of women, the virtuous and the wicked, uh, the respectful and, and, the, uh, and the unrespectful, right? Um, and, the, uh, and, the, um, um, and, and the high and the low and so on, right? Um, and there are these specific characteristics of what makes a woman virtuous and what makes them wicked. Uh, in the virtuous category, uh, I mean, the one thing that is emphasized over and over and over again is obedience to the male authority figure in their life, whether it's the father or the husband or the king, right? And also it's modesty, uh, it's quiet submission, and it is suffering in, uh, suffering in silence uh, in, um, in, when, um, uh, in, in the face of adversity, right? Um, so what, and on the other hand, so what makes it, makes a woman wicked? Well, uh, ambitious, selfish, thinks for herself, uh, ruthless, and uh, uh, concerned with their own happiness above the happiness of other people in their lives, and so on and so on. Right? This, this is the wicked woman. Right? So, so now um, this is how patriarchal society tries to control women, right, and keep them in a subordinate position. The strategy goes something like this: one, hold up a uh, ideal image of the virtual woman that is basically impossible for the vast majority of women to fulfill, right? I mean, somebody of flawless virtue, I mean, and who's, who's, who's not frivolous, who's serious and all of that, and, and, uh, um, and, and make, uh, you know, women who regards themselves as respectful, uh, res uh, you know, uh, respectable, um, feel um, perennially guilty that they are not living up to that standard, right? That, that's, uh, you know, you do that one thing, right? And then the second strategy is to scare them uh, with this, with this vision of the wicked woman, 
um, to, uh, to which you could fall, uh, fall into if you are not at least trying all the time to, uh, to become that flawless virtual, uh, virtuous woman, right? Um, now, this is a means in which to keep women locked into positions of submission and make uh, the submission seem like the highest form of virtue. And right? uh, now um, the thing is, I you know as as, as troubling as, as as troubling as it is for modern um, you know readers and modern uh, critics to think about this, um, I, this is I, I think extremely extremely relevant when thinking about its significance. And what I'll do is that I will return to this theme when I get to the third part about how you know how it's being portrayed because that it has a, it has a really interesting uh, history. Because again, one would say that. Wow, uh, that kind of binary is really, really inappropriate to uh, to modern Korean society, where a vast majority of women are walking and uh, and they have ambitions, they have thoughts of their own, and they are fighting for their rights and their uh, you know their position in society and all that. Um, and uh, um, and so so why, if that is the case, why why are everyone, men and women, enjoying still enjoying this story? In various different TV, uh, you know, TV and uh, movie shows. So, and I'll get to that. Right. Um, all right. So, uh, the, the more complicated question is sort of history. So, I'm gonna at this point, I'm gonna put my his, uh, historian's hat on and said, okay. So that's the story. Um, the the king and this, you know, this flawlessly virtuous woman and this uh, wicked woman, and the king sort of stuck in between them, uh, going back and forth between them. So, what's the story, right? Um, well, here's what I here's what what I can tell you, right? Um, if you are, uh, and, and this is a really big problem, I, I think even in some historical scholarship that I've seen that this story is so familiar to people, they actually mistake it for the actual history when it has, it has you know, only very, very thin connection to it, right? Um, so um, here's, what, here's what I'll, you know, uh, what, what the, the sort of background I'll, I'll provide you to, to have an insight into what really happened in those decades from 1680 to 1701. Um, which is this, right? Um, if you are a Joseon dynasty king, so you, 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 your father died and he just ascended the uh, throne, right? And you're wearing what they call the dragon robe, right? Um, what you realize that one of the biggest problems that you're going to have to face as king, in order, especially if you're an activist king who are really, uh, who really want to do something really interesting and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and good and be a good king and so on, is the presence of your high officials being all divided into factions, right? Uh, factionalism, factional conflict is the thing that's going to plague the Korean court at the upper, uh, uppermost echelon, right? Um, now, what, what do I mean by faction? Well, as you can imagine, in any kingdom, in any uh, time period, you're going to have high-ranking officials who are going to be friends and allies, and they're going to work in concert because they have, you know, a, a similar similar uh, worldviews and similar um, ambitions and so on. But um, it went further than that. Um, during the time of King Sanjo uh, in the late 16th century, um, that, that's the king who, was, uh, who ruled Korea during the time of the great Japanese invasions. Um, these alliances became formalized into something that re resembles more like the modern political parties. Right. I mean, I mean, they, you know, they had names for it and people were members of this um, members of this faction. And and the first faction that got formed were the so-called Eastern faction versus the Western faction. Uh, and the reason for those directions is that um, the leaders of the two faction, they lived in the eastern part of the capital and the other one lived in the western part of the capital. And therefore, they became uh, named Eastern and Western faction. Right. So they clashed for a while, and what tends to happen, what, what um, almost inevitably happened in, in the course of Joseon Dynasty's history is that when one faction becomes dominant and it becomes powerful, it tends to fragment, right? So it, te it tends to break up into further uh, parties, right? And I obviously, I don't have the time to go uh, it's, it's right now, but you know, uh, during the time of the, uh, of the do dominance of the Eastern faction, it split into the Southern and the Northern faction, and uh, and when at a later point when northern faction became dominant, it split into the so-called greater northern faction and the lesser northern faction. Same thing with the western faction; it split into the, what they call the old learning faction versus the new learning faction, and so on and so on. So so you so you ended up by by the time of King uh, Sukchong, you ended up with just this really complicated series of uh, alliances and, and formalized factions, right? Um, and what is the problem with that? Well. Um, you know, a lot of times when you, you're a king and you're trying to get stuff done, you realize that 
you know, these factions were more interested in tearing each other down than actually getting stuff done. And so you got gridlock, right? You got gridlock. Um, and also you got obstructionism. When officials, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they feel that uh, when they're trying to push the king toward a certain direction, they will favor their, uh, their factions. Um, and also the other uh, problem is that uh, a lot of times, especially for the really good kings with good ideas, they realize that these members of a lot of these uh, factions, they are putting faction above country. Sounds familiar? Uh, <laughs> they are looking out for the, what is good for the country above what, what is good for the faction rather than good of the country, right? Now, um, the, the, then the question is, you're the chosen dynasty king, so what do you do? What do you do about the factions? Well, there's numbers of things you could do, provided that you are a strong king uh, who do want to get stuff done. I mean, Korean history is full of really weak kings who are not able to handle them at all. I mean, some of them would, uh, you know, oversaw governments, they couldn't get anything done because of all these factional fights. Um, and, um, and, and also, um, you know, I, I, you know what, one of the ways it was done is that um, one method that might seem like a good idea, you're a king, so what you, what you do is, I don't want gridlock, I don't want all this infighting, so what I'll do is I'll favor one faction over all the others. I'll make them supreme. Right, so that I, you know, so that it's so that that one faction and I can rule the uh, kingdom in common. Um, this has its danger because this is exactly what King Kwang He did in the early 17th century. He favored the greater northern faction over all others, so the northern uh, greater northern faction became supreme. This caused all the other factions to gang up on him, and there was an actual coup d'état. Right, where, where they dethroned the king and replaced him with, uh, with 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 one of his cousins, right? Um, so so th 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 this, th I mean, so this could have had a, a, a really big problem. Um, now King Yongjo, uh, who is the son of King Sukjong, who's going to preside over the 18th century, he is widely praised uh, for his policy called Tangpyeong, which means magnificent harmony. And uh, um, and he he's seen as sort of the, the guy who figured it out. And so what what Tang Pyeong policy, uh, the magnificent harmony policy, um, um, consisted of was um, every time there's a vacant uh, position open for an official, and he need to appoint somebody, he would take turns among all the different factions, so that there will be basically even numbers of officials from all the factions, so they would all balance themselves out, so no one became too dominant, right? Um, now, um, but I, as I've explained, I mean, it's like, uh, but but King Yongjo's success with this owes a lot to his father, King Sukjong, who, who we're talking about. King Sukjong had something else altogether. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and uh, it is a policy that is known as Hua Guk, Hua Guk. Um, and, uh, and this is something that he uh, he um, um, uh, puts into action what, once he, he becomes a king in the year 1674. And uh, Hua Guk uh, literally translates as turn of state. But I think um, uh, an accurate but more colloquial translation would be turning the government upside down. <laughs> so um, so this is what King Suk Chung did, right? So it would do, right? Um, so what he did was um, he would, just like King Kwang Ha, uh, Kwang He, he would favor one faction over the other and make them supreme and wait until they become really, really complacent. Right, and think that there's no, I mean, the king loves us so that there's no danger, right? And just wait until the moment when they're so supreme and the king secretly organizes with the opposing factions to virtually overnight decapitate the leadership of the first faction, just destroy them. And in a matter of days, execute, exile, and confiscate the property of, of the leadership of the uh, province, uh, of the faction, and just completely oust them, right? So now, then, what happens is that the uh, the, the faction that helped him do it, they become supreme, right? King Sukjong does the same thing. Wait until they become supreme, right? Until they're all they're all set, right? All powerful, and then boom, bring down the hammer again. And he kept doing that until there were a series of, as I said, turning the government upside down, so that by the time he was done, all the factions had become so weakened that there's nobody standing in the way of central monarchical authority. But in order for him to do this, I, I cannot tell you how many people he had to slaughter, how many high-ranking people had to, he had to slaughter, and very, very quickly, 
right? Um, and uh, um, now, so um, so just I, I I can't give you the details uh, 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 the time, but I'll I'll, I'll give you a sort of very very uh, quick um, timeline, right? Um, so during the time of Quick King Sukjong, the two main factions that he had to worry about was the Southern faction and the Western faction. Um, and so when uh, when he became uh, 16, uh, in, king in 1674, the Southern Southern faction was supreme. A massive purge occurs in the year 1680. Uh, Southern, uh, the Southern faction is decapitated, right? Uh, and then the Western, uh, their enemy, the Western faction becomes supreme in 1689. Then uh, King Sukjong turns on them, right? So, so five years later, uh, it, it, it is uh, it is it is now the uh, it is now the you know they, they go back to Noma and and all of this leadership have died, right? Um, okay, so. Um, Here's 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 uh, the thing that you have to remember, right? So where in, in why am I talking about all this faction? So um, and the question is where do Queen Inhyun and Chang Yibian fit into this, right? Um, so uh, Chang, uh, Queen, uh, King Suk Jung's marriage to Queen Inhyun occurs in the year 1681, and this is the year right after the Southern faction has been completely purged. Um, and Queen Inhyun's father is one of the leaders of the Western faction. So the complete victory of the Western faction is cemented further by the king's marriage to the daughter of one of the leaders of the uh, of the Western faction, right? Um, and then uh, what happens is that in 1689, that's the year that the king is ousted from power. That's the year of the purge of the Western faction. Right? So the so uh, so so she has to go. She has to now go. Um, and and one of the things that the that, that the opposing southern faction, um, in order to um, in order to you know uh, become uh, dominant, they really push the king to elevate concubine Chang as the queen. So 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 the concubine Chang is really now regarded as a woman of the southern faction. Right uh, until 1694. What happens in 1694? That's the year that again you got the turning of the state. Right? And southern faction is completely destroyed, and the queen is brought back. Right now, so okay, so the picture. I, I'm, I'm not sure you're getting it. Right, the picture is that these women were pawns in this vicious, vicious political game uh, that that Suk Chung was playing with the ultimate purpose of, um, you know, uh, ultimate purpose of, uh, you know, centralizing monarchical authority, centralizing the power of the king. Um, now. By saying that, am I saying that like he he didn't have any real feelings for these women that him depicting him as somebody who falls in love with the queen and then falls in love with concubines? No, because I, I you know I think human beings are very very complex, right? Um, and uh, so um, what, uh, the the way in which I'll put it is this, um, you know, there, there's a remarkable comparison with what happened here with um, uh, the divorce of uh, King Henry, the first divorce of King Henry VIII uh, from Catherine of Aragon. Right. Uh, and uh, and so, um, so, you know, and, you know, because, uh, she, she's not producing on air, just just like Queen Inhyun, right? Uh, asked for a divorce from the Pope. Pope's not granting it for very uh, difficult political reasons. So he actually cuts off England from the Catholic Church, you know, creates the um, Anglican Church and and, uh, um, and 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 brings in Anne Boleyn. But when she's she fails to produce a male heir, she has to go. Well, does that mean that King Henry VIII wasn't really in love with Anne Boleyn and it was all about babies and all that? Well, I wouldn't say it because human beings are not simple. I mean, I don't think it's either or, right? Um, I would say that, um, look, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I mean, you know, from based on what I know, I of King Henry VIII as well as King Suk Chong. I mean, these are human beings who really did have feelings for these people and so on. But, um, but just imagine if you're a king the responsibilities and the duties and and just difficulty of, of of being a monarch is so overwhelming that when these women have to go they have to go right and and your feelings at the end of the day doesn't really matter right and uh, and you know and, and that doesn't mean that they didn't have feelings but it's it's um but i but what i but the problem i mean the, the problem that i see here is that if you see uh the depictions of king suk jung in films and drama it's always as this erratic, passionate, you know, at one point he loves her, then he loves her and all that, right? Um, when I read the historical re records, that's not who I see. Uh, I see a cool, calculating, and just absolutely ruthless king who knows exactly what he's doing. 
and that these women are, are just, I mean, it's, it's a chess piece and this chess piece now has to go, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that he didn't really love this chess piece, right? But but it's a game, I'm gonna win the game, right? So, um, so you know, the thing is, I, um, um, you know, what, what I would have to say is that, I mean, the last thing I wanna say on this point before I move on to the last part of my talk is that, um, as a historian, I wish people outside of the uh, outside of the uh, country knew more about uh, what an extraordinary time in Korean history the 18th century was, right? Uh, it, and uh, um, it was a time of prolonged peace and prosperity, social mobilization, um, and so that um, I, you know, uh, I, you know, historians calculate that when the Joseon Dynasty were founded in the late 14th century. Only about five percent uh, could count themselves as Yangban, uh, the aristocracy. But uh, by the time of King Jongjo, over a quarter now claimed at least some Yangban privilege, and these are commoners who bought this privilege because they were able to rise up. Um, so there was lots of sources of mobility, lots of scientific discoveries, intellectual discoveries, and just an extraordinary time. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, because my, you know, uh, my, what what are my areas of expertise is enlightenment. Uh, uh, Europe. Um, while the Enlightenment is going on in Europe, I mean, Korea is having its own period of Enlightenment under these enlightened despots. Um, and the two people who are given more credit, uh, the, the, the two people who are given credit is uh, King Yongjo, King Suk Jong son, um, and his grandson, King Jongjo. Um, well, because there's all this sort of circumstance under which his crown prince uh, had to be executed. But that's another story altogether. Right? That's, all right. So, um, and uh, um, and there there were uh, um, there were extraordinary men, extraordinary brilliant, uh, who took their job seriously. Um, intellectuals, brilliant intellectuals. Um, and uh, but you know the thing is, I I I, I don't think people give King Suk Jong enough credit, because what allowed King Youngjo to do all of this is that King Suk Jong, through his absolute ruthlessness, just sort of cleared the table and allowed the son to do his thing. Um, and, uh, and really, really, by which I mean, really, really kept uh, the factionalism under control, and uh, um, and and then you know, uh, and 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 provided enough for central authority for the monarchy to do stuff, right? Uh, now that's not the end of the story. Factionalism does come back, right? And it actually actually causes uh, Korea, it's chosen dynasty Korea, to decline severely in the 19th century. So um, King Yongjo and Jongjo is regarded as the last two, you know, truly great kings, right? Um, all right, so um, so I so that that's the way I look at it. I mean, so that you know, I mean, so the, in, in the historical context, right? Um, so there's the novel, which is a story basically about passion, uh, you know, uh, and uh, about this woman and all that. And there's the history, you know, which is this this just really really uh, you know uh, difficult uh, difficult and vicious and ruthless game that was being played in the name of um, uh, you know the name of opposing factionalism and. Uh, um, uh, and strengthening royal authority, right? Um, all right, so um, so to get to my last part about modern adaptation and modern views of the story, right? Um, so what some of you may be thinking, wow, um, you know, what is this ongoing fascination with the story when, as I said, I, these inappropriate pat patriarchal strategy um, is um, sounds really terrible at a time when as I said, women, I, I mean, there's still a long way to go in Korea, but it's its nothing like the Joseon Dynasty, right? Uh, you know, um, I, you know, uh, education has really, you know, um, uh, it, it has caught up and women are doing all kinds of interesting things and ambitious things and so on. Um, and, uh, um, but, you know, I would i would have to say that in, in some quarters, um, that kind of binary thinking, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the flawless, virtuous woman who's submissive and who's obedient, who suffers uh, through calamities without complaint versus the wicked, ambitious, you know, uh, woman. Um, that is still to this day, I think, used as an ideological weapon to at least slow down the advancements of women's rights and opportunities in Korean society. Right, um, and uh, um, and 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 it's uh, and and it's and I think it's it's caused a lot of damage. It's caused a lot of uh, damage. So, um, um, and so you you may think that well, so this still functions in a in a kind of a conservative way um, to so, as an end. And so, if you're if you're a progressive, if you're a feminist, uh, you'll be opposed to this story. Well, um, you know the the way in which Korean culture has dealt with this story is actually. It, it really fascinating because um, I think it gotten more um, in, interesting than that. Um, so 
so when you look at, um, I mean, first of all, um, when you look at Korean dramas and novels and movies, and there's countless of them, right? It didn't go away. The story's still very much there to the extent that every Korean knows the story uh, or they think, they think they know the story. And as I said, the problem with thinking that the story is history, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but one of, one of the things that they come out that's really, really obvious when you watch these TV shows and uh, drama is that nobody is interested in Queen Inyeon. <laughs> I mean, a woman of perfect virtue who's flawless, right? Boring, 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 right? Nobody cares, right? Everybody is watching con uh, Concubine Chan. I mean, she's the person of interest, right? Um, and, and a lot of the stories are centered around her, but in different ways. Like if you see the earlier versions of the story, um, she's sort of, I mean, she's still really wicked. She's really the villain of the story, but she's the villain that you love to hate, right? Uh, and, uh, um, and, and so, um, and so it's it's so it's, it's it becomes really really interesting for uh, for people. And, but at, at but later on, as we get further and further into uh, into the second part of the uh, 20th century, um, actually the changes occur in this drama where she becomes more and more complex. Until I've seen productions where she's the sympathetic one, right? To this, I mean, you know, Queen Inhan is like almost like a statue. She's like a perfect statue, right? It's like a um, and uh, um, and so I just want to show you a couple of images that's related to this uh, that I find um, you know completely interesting. Uh, one is that um, unfortunately there is no contemporary portrait of either concubine Chang or King Suk Chang, right? Uh, but but we do we do have this image of Queen Inyan, Lady Min, um, and the next is um, I, I found this cool website where they show that these are these are all the actresses who have played the concubine Chang over the years, right? And, uh, uh, and what is extraordinary is that if you look at who they are, they are some of the best, act, most renowned actresses of a generation. Um, and one thing that I want to point out is that if you look at the third woman, uh, that's Yoon Yeo Jung, whom you may recognize as the grandmother from the film uh, Minari, which is in theaters right now, which people are watching and getting a lot of attention. Yeah, that's her. And that's one of her first, uh, she's not in costume here, of course, but, uh, and uh, she, uh, so she's not, um, and that was one of her first uh, major roles that she had all the way back in the 70s, right? Um, now, um, so in the, if you examine these, what you see is that her becoming increasingly complicated because that's who people are interested in seeing. Not, not, not boring or Queen Inion, who cares? Right? Uh, uh, but also they do become increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, sympathetic. Um, now, the groundbreaking, the truly groundbreaking show was the seventh one, where um, if you look at the seventh, um, that is the actress Kim Hesu, who's wonderful, and she's still doing really, really wonderful stuff, uh, you know, and 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 film uh, these days. Um, and it was a uh, um, this was a, this was a TV drama. There was a hundred episodes, hundred episodes. They they played <laughs> they played two episodes a week um, uh, for for a full year, and th and this was two thousand and two, right? So this is um, but. Here's one of the interesting things, and here's what I'll point out. Uh, so hold on. Uh, so this is the ad from it, right? So there's uh, there's Kim Hesu on the left playing, uh, you know, uh, uh, concubine Chang, and there's King Suk Chung in the middle, and uh, and there's Queen Inhyun. Who cares? Who cares about Queen Inhyun? Right. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, this broke new ground uh, in the sense that um, you know what I really like about this version, in, and this is all the way in 2002. That's that's fairly recent, right? Um, what I like about this version is that instead of doing a simple flip where the queen is the evil one and the concubine is a good person, they both made them really, really nuanced, right? So, so you have a concubine uh, she doing a lot of the bad things, but you know for good reasons. And you you see the sort of the full background and of uh, um and uh, and the thing is, I mean, what uh, I just want to read a, a very brief passage. I um so what she um. So I found this interview with the actress Kim Hesu, and this is her explaining why her role is different. And she says the following, Chang Yi Bin has long been portrayed as a temptress and evil woman, but my Chang Yi Bin is different. She's a strong-willed uh, person seeking to overcome the status prejudice of her society. There are scenes in which she organizes intrigues and seduces the king, but I want the audience to understand her actions as the strategy for survival on the part of somebody who loves life, right? 
Um, and also in the interview itself, she she uh, she credits this sort of different version of Chang Yibin to the fact that all the script writers were women. Uh, and so they were give, able to uh, g uh, give a completely different uh, feel to this, right? Um, so, so what you what you have there that I find really really interesting is that, um, yes, I mean, of course, this this you know this traditional view of uh, uh, of this story is very very inappropriate for the modern era, but uh, but modern Korean audiences, including modern women, have not rejected the story but they are subverting it in a very interesting way from the inside. I mean, first by paying all the attention to her, um, you know, like, like for instance, imagine if you're an actress, who would you want to play? Right? Are you boring Queen India who <laughs> just sits there and just be virtuous all the time, right? Where's, where's Chang Yibin is a juicy, juicy role, right? Um, and uh, um, so, um, so what, in conclusion, um, I, what, what I want to point out is that uh, this, um, I mean, this, 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 you know, shift of attention to Chang Yibin, making her more interesting and so, uh, because it is in direct contrast to what it's like if you read a novel. The novel's all about the queen, right? About how you should like use her as a kind of a, a you know, a ideal, right? Um, but, um, but you do have to look at, so you do have to look, uh, look at the novel in its own terms and the actual history in its own terms, and also uh, be very, very aware of the ideology behind it and how modern women uh, expressions of it is subverting it. And, uh, and I think it just says something very hopeful and great about the Korean imagination in that it can take a lesson from a patriarchal past and instead of simply rejecting it, make use of it for ends that are much more appropriate for today. Right? And that's where I'll conclude. Thank you so much, Minsu. Um, that was just, um, I. Just like many Koreans, I feel like I know this story inside out, but still it's all, it's never ceases to um, fascinate us um, with all the details. So, so thank you so much. I always said um, Game of Thrones had nothing um, when they are compared to the Joseon Dynasty's um, history with all the palace intrigues and um, passion affairs. I wanted to start asking you some questions and I actually wanted to ask you a question that uh, from one of our viewers is that, um, so how soon after the death of the queen did the history become fictionalized? We didn't talk really, you didn't go into the details about, there are many stories of when this story started right. to get fictionalized. Right. Right. Um, so, and, the, so the question is, when did the fictionalization begin and by whom and what kind of person would sort of rewrite the history? Right. Um, yeah, there's, there's an entire history that I, 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 I could go into that I can't get, get into at this time because I, I've, got, I've done a lot of research on what uh, an unpopular commercial fiction that began to be written in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. I mean, these, these are four popular consumption by commoner readers, right? Uh, and, um, and, the, and the story of uh, uh, Queen Inhyun that I see, it's very much, it, it fits into that genre very, very well. So, um, and that's why I place it at the earliest in the late 18th century, right? Now, there are other materials here and there that they used, right? Um, and, I, uh, and because of the lack of evidence, there aren't any one, definitively fiction work that can be found to be, uh, you know, from an earlier period. Um, by the way, um, this is something that of high annoyance to me. Uh, there's a theory, there's a mere theory that this story was written by a palace woman who was witness to these events, right? This is completely without evidence, completely without oh. evidence. Um, and, uh, um, and um, unfortunately, I, I, somebody pointed out to me that that's what it actually says in the Wikipedia article of, uh, oh. you know, that this was written by a palace woman at this time, and it's just it's just completely nonsense because that type of writing that I translated that's that's from a much later period. Um, now, uh, so um, so so I so but they are sort of because this story is famous. Uh, that that story shows up in people's essays when they are talking about womanly virtues, uh, and also in history books, uh, sort of his an anecdotal accounts and all that. So that story has been around. So, but it didn't become a novel novel until at least in the 18th century. So a full century since the event, right? Um, now, one thing, there's one theory that I find completely intriguing that, um, that, I, I, um, that I, I, I didn't have time to track down, but I, this makes perfect sense to me that 
in noble families, um, in Yangban families, um, they had uh, their sort of the informal internal records of some of their most illustrious ancestors. And that they, and, and it was not circulated publicly, but within the clan so that, you know, uh, members of that clan could read about what great people are not. Uh, and there's a theory that at least parts of the story may have come from an internal account from the Min family of the, of the virtuous queen. And also, the, uh, this is the one thing that I, I wasn't able to, uh, you know, get into. Also, the family of Pak Te Bo, who's, a, who's another character in the novel, um, who, who, who is a, um, an official who speaks up for the Queen In Hyun, um, and he's tortured and executed, uh, and tortured and uh, dies as a result of his execution afterwards. Um, his family, uh, I mean, it, it, I mean the, the Pak family that he comes from is also an illustrious Yangban family. So that parts of that may have come from sort of an internal document as well, right? Um, but I, uh, but there's no evidence that a, a completed, uh, coherent novel of the story of Inhyun uh, uh, was not uh, was, was composed any time before the late 18th century. So a full century since the events. Okay. So I want. I always wondered, um, you know, sort of that modern fascination with this story and especially with the concubine Chang is the fact that she actually becomes the queen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not something that happened normally, was it? Um, and as you mentioned, the queen usually comes from a very august um, Yangban, the aristocrat family. So if you can tell us just quickly, who usually became queen in mm -hmm. during the Joseon dynasty, and you know, flawless virtue um, <laughs> is, I guess, expected. But what was the process like? And the fact that this concubine became a queen, even though it was for a short period of time, what did that actually mean? And I also wanted to ask the fact that she's not from this August. Mm -hmm. um, aristocratic family, was she sort of doomed from the beginning, um, not having that yeah. kind of support? Yeah, um, at, at a fairly young age, royal princesses, uh, uh, princess, um, like when they're even like 12, 13 or 14, um, they, 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 they undergo this extremely complicated selection process. I mean, they have an entire committee <laughs> and, uh, um, and they uh, select and interview various different women from, uh, you know, uh, uh, families with impeccable credentials and, uh, um, and they examine the girls and they question the girls and so on, right? Uh, so already at 13, you know, 14, they're already married. Um, and so the selection process there is, I mean, this is for the queen, this is for the official concert, right? Um, but it is, but there, there was a uh, knowledge that sometimes having just a queen may not be enough because she may not be able to produce an heir. So it was completely allowable and not only allowable, but expected that King would have concubines, right? Um, even King Sejong the Great, whom the Koreans uh, admire, he had like a dozen concubines and he had, he had something like 80 children by them. I mean, eight, I mean, 80 children, and, but this was, this was seen as something that you had to do to make sure the continuation of the line. Um, so now, so the official process for the selection of queen was very, very strict and, and all, all that. But after that, in terms of the concubine, uh, anybody could like, I mean, she, um, I mean, you, anybody could become a concubine uh, as, and it was really up to the king. Um, like, like for instance, um, King Yongjo's mother was like a, like a servant girl. I mean, she was like, she was basically a female janitor um, and who just caught the eye of King Sukjong and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and made her official concubine. Now, once you're raised to official concubinage, um, then anything could happen. Right? Um, and so that because you are you are not, I mean, you, this is not, I mean, you're not like an illegitimate secret mistress. I mean, you are offi an officially recognized royal concubine. Um, so if the queen dies uh, or if, you know, she's ousted for various reasons, um, there's absolutely no reason that a concubine from even the lowest uh, social status could be raised to queen. Uh, well, I mean, well, one of the very you know, few ways in which uh, women from the lowest classes could actually have social mobility up to being the queen, right? Uh, but this is very rare, um, this is very rare. But, um, but King Yongjo's mother, who began as a slave girl in the palace, mm -hmm. I mean, she, she had a long illustrious life, um, 
you know, uh, because, you know, things just worked out for her, right? I mean, you know, her son became the king and all that, right? Uh, yeah, as far as, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, concubine Chang's um, background, yeah, I mean, that that um, that gave her a severe, I, I wouldn't say they doomed her, but they gave her a uh, severe disadvantage because um, she was, I mean, in my cold political reading of the story, she was used first as a pawn by the king and then by the uh, the faction that was out to you know uh, you know oust the other one right uh, and to uh, and to what extent she herself wielded power is um, is a is a very difficult question to uh, unravel because um, you know uh, as you point out I mean she didn't come from a fancy Yangban family so she so there wasn't a group of kinsmen in the upper echelons of the government um, who were ready to protect her for just just because she was a member of the family. So I would say that that didn't necessarily doom her, but they gave her a massive disadvantage in terms of what she's trying to do. Because I, I think the actress Kim Esu was right. I see her mainly as a woman who's just trying to survive, who's find herself in this extremely difficult situation and knows that if one thing goes wrong, she could just lose everything and in fact get executed, which is what happened. And uh, um, so she had to do what I, I, I just feel that she had to do what she had to do. Um, and we really don't know that much about her, per se, mm -hmm. correct? Um, yeah. I mean, you mentioned that in the novel you um, translated, the queen is portrayed as this the sort of the paragon of virtues while mm -hmm. she's the wicked woman. But we don't really know if she really was Mm -hmm. vicious or ambitious or mm -hmm. it, 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 so there is not much um we no actually know so maybe that's why she is such a fascinating character because you can project so much into her onto her um yeah. from from modern point of view i wanted to ask you this might sound a little frivolous but um speaking of the ad modern adaptations of the mm -hmm. stories one of the most um famous um, scenes is actually the end when um, concubine Chang is executed. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like Hanley's soliloquy for the Korean actresses. How are you going to portray that scene when you are asked to drink the poison? Um, mm -hmm. And there, you know, it's how the, these women, these actresses portray that scene becomes the point of, you know, uh, discussion and um, critic criticism um do we know exactly like what happened i mean again <laughs> yeah. is that complete fabrication we do know that she was ordered mm -hmm. to die um yeah. by the yeah. king um yeah. but and then there are all these wild stories that are associated with her death mm -hmm. so is there any um are those those wild scenes of her kicking away the poison and refusing to die or whatever is there any validity to them, or do we ever going? Are we ever going to know? Oh no, that that's pure fictional drama, <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. It's like because I, you know, after watching hundred episodes of her doing stuff, right? You need you do need a cathartic ending, right? No, all, all you get in the records. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that something like that didn't happen, but all you get in the records is that um, the king, you know, uh, sent a poison for her to drink. Um, and ordered her to drink it, and she did, and she died, right? Um, but uh, but it's in the novel where she just absolutely refuses to do it, uh, so she has to be manhandled, in, you know. And uh, and in, in the Kim Hazu version, there's the terrible scene where somebody has to uh, put a stick in her mouth and pry it open, and then they pour the poison <laughs> in, right? And uh, and it's just it's just really awful, right? No, that's it's pure drama, um, and so. So, you know, as a historian, I, I, I can't say that definitely that didn't happen, that she made it this huge fuss and refused to go. But um, but that's fiction. That's completely in the realm of fiction, uh, because the re records are very, very bare about, you know, the exact uh, circumstance under the death. And, you know, when we hear the stories of royal court and queens and kings and concubines, all this, you know, this sounds so glamorous. Yet, <laughs> you know, when you hear your story, it just seems so dangerous almost. Um, what was it really like for these women, you think? Did, were they aware that they really had absolutely no um, control over their lives? I mean, concubine Zhang, especially because she did something that everybody wanted her to do, which is produce a male heir. Um, mm -hmm. But even that did not protect her. Um, mm -hmm. um, being the mother of the future king, 
was not enough protection for her. What do you think it was like for these women? Yeah, um, especially from the modern perspective, it was, I, I think it was hell from beginning to end. I mean, it was just, um, I, I mean, I, you know, just, I mean, to live a life where everybody's watching you uh, and you have to act in a completely flawless manner and so on, right? Um, so, I, I mean, I think I, I you know, yeah, um, I, you know, forget about Disney depictions of, you know, of monarchy. I, I think if you were a young, a little girl of, uh, at the age of 12, 13 or 14, and you just been selected to become the future queen, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the worst thing that's going to ever happen to you. Um, you know, because you are, you are going to be stuck in a, you know, role where you absolutely have to be like, you're observed constantly, you have to uh, go through all these et etiquettes and so on, right? Um, you know what it's good for? It's good for the men of a family, right? I mean, because now they have a huge, huge advantage. Um, and uh, uh, relatives of her are gonna, you know, uh, you know, uh, relatives are gonna, gonna get um, titles and they're gonna have access to a high officialdom and so on, right? So what you, what's basically happening is that their family is sacrificing this little girl for the sake of the good of the larger family, uh, larger clan, especially for the men who are in officialdom, right? Uh, so it's, 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 it's really not a, a pleasant life. Uh, now, I just want to correct the thing. Um, it's not that they were completely powerless. Uh, there, there were rooms that they could do it. And, and there are certain occasions where Queen Dao just, uh, you know, um, so, the, um, so the, the wife of a dead king sometimes wielded significant power, especially within the uh, royal household. So, um, but it's just that I, you know, I mean, the, the odds were so much against them that there were just uh, so many obstacles that they had to uh, uh, overcome in order to be able to do that. And listening to how you describe what was going on in, you know, at the 17th and 18th century in Chosan, um, whether it's the gender um, issues or whether it's the sort of the political factions. I mean, there is, you, you, you can't help but wonder sort of the modern life still being reflected on those stories. There are mm -hmm. so many similarities. Um, hopefully we are getting better, whatever that means. Um, but given all the interest in the royalty that exists even today, and yeah, we yeah. just witnessed this whole drama about another monarchy um, and how it seems to be still so invested in the personal lives of the royalty. And as you mentioned, this story has been turned into TV dramas and films and novels, as much as the story of the Henry VI and you know Henry VIII and um, all the other royalties. Um, what do you think is our fascination right. with royalty? Yeah. Well, like, why do we care about yeah. their life so much? Whether you know whether were they in love or not, or what happened to that? Is it just because it's such a brutal, like um, cruel stories that, yeah. um, what do you think is, is the fascination? Yeah, um, and I, I, I think the modern Korean attitude toward Joseon Dynasty monarchy is very, very complicated, right? Um, because there's, there's one thing that Korea has in common with France, which is that these are two countries with a very long and illustrious monarchical tradition that in the modern era chose not to become constitutional monarchies. Right, uh, having at least a figurehead king, right? Um, and in the case of France, it's obvious because they are very proud of their republican and revolutionary traditions, and you know, uh, and and so on. But um, in the case of Korea, um, it's um, it's because of the com utter and complete failure of the Joseon Dynasty monarchy at the end of the uh, period, you know, to do anything about the uh, Japanese incursion. The fact that ultimately, when uh, Korea was colonized, um, the the royal family. Um, they collaborated and most of them went on to live in Japan, live, live luxur luxurious life in Japan. And so, um, so not only were they, you know, the, 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 the reputation of the Yi family just fell to the dirt, um, but also um, because pretty much all independent activists, whether we're talking about the nationalist ones in, that ended up in South Korea or the communist one in North Korea, they were also modernizers. So that um, when they were fighting against the Japanese empire and, and, and look forward to a time of independence, they were not looking forward to returning to Joseon dynasty monarchy. They wanted to create a modern state and in which there was no room for 
uh, King, you know, especially the Yi clan. Oh my God, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, I mean, that's the one ones who just, you know, uh, just rolled over when the Japanese came in. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, so, and and that, and that's why we're, you know, unlike Britain, you know, uh, and unlike Spain, and unlike a lot of these countries that ha that still maintain uh, monarchies, we're we're not we're not one of them, right? Um, now the thing is, I think for us, uh, especially for South Korea. Um, the country has become so different from the past that it Joseon Dynasty is the is is an exotic foreign country, <laughs> uh, and and there's this sort of this exoticism to this that uh, because you know I mean you know that the cliche is the past is a foreign country. Um, it is another world altogether, but it's fascinating to uh, for modern Koreans to think that this is a completely different world. Uh, you know, uh, yet at the same time we come from those people. We come from those era. Um, so that kind of, you know, sense of familiarity and unfamiliarity is what is at work. But at the same time, I think Koreans are still looking toward Korean dramas for lessons about politics, uh, lessons about society, lessons about how people deal with each other. Um, and now, you know, Korea is into producing all this like... Um, you know, what they call fusion saguk. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, historical dramas that have nothing to do with historical accuracy that, you know, we fill with people who acted nothing like, you know, uh, Joseph Dynasty people uh, in which they are still looking. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned Game of Thrones earlier. Um, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when I was in Korea, I had a conversation with a young person uh, who was a graduate student in history who was telling me about what a big hit Game of Thrones was in Korea. And I said, well, uh, you know, why do you think that's the case, right? Um, and because he also lived in America, his theory was that it's for very different reasons. Uh, because I, I, he said that I don't, I mean, although I think the Koreans liked all the magic and the dragons and all of that, that, that they weren't that interested in it. They were watching it like they watched Chosen Dynasty historical dramas. The political uh, intrigues. The political and... dynamics for the rise and fall of dynasties. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, to, uh, and on that level, this seemed completely familiar. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's that, but with white people and dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so this was, I mean, it was, it, it was completely natural for, uh, for that show to find audience in, in, in South Korea. Yeah. On that note, um, I'm sure there might be more new versions of the story of concubine Zhang and the queen and who knows um, all the other stories that can be um, created out of the historical details. Um, and I know we can talk on and on and on about that, but unfortunately that's all the time we have for now. So thanks again, Professor Kang for your talk. Um, it was fascinating, so entertaining and, and interesting. So we wish you all the best, um, stay healthy. Um, special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility. And to our interns, Jia and Hiju, for getting all the questions and doing email outreach and social media postings. And of course, our thanks to you, our viewers and members of the Korea Society. We hope you'll join us again. Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you and good night.